Then it will be time. Then it will be time. I've got a spare wearer tie today. There's a boss came this morning. Well, one of the bosses, every clothes is here this morning. And, uh, I saw uh, the other co chairman, um, oh, Chris Banks, at Dorsey yesterday, so I thought, well, better treat them both the same. And, uh, that was, yeah, obviously, I've got to put the mic in the right position. Psalm 86, verses 11 to 13. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love towards me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. Let's pray. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we admit that you are the gracious, compassionate and faithful God. You are the Lord our God. We thank you that we can have this relationship, this reconciled relationship where we can call you Father and you know us as your sons. We thank you for this again tonight, Heavenly Father. We thank you as later we will meet around the communion table how this was achieved. It came at a price through the death of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, there where his body was given for us, went through the suffering, the pain, the agony, the mental anguish, there before and on the cross, and there blood was shed, his blood was shed, that makes the sinner clean. And we thank you for this once again, Heavenly Father. We realise there are blessings and benefits that come with this as well, and again we thank you for them. Lord, we'll be with us tonight, during this hour, during this time together as we continue in worship, as we continue to sing your praises, as we continue to pray, as we hear your word read and spoken of. Bless us through it, we pray, and may we praise you accordingly, Heavenly Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for loving me.
king's command, couriers went throughout Israel and Judea with letters from the king and from his officials, which read, People of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, that he may return to you who are left, who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Do not be like your fathers and brothers who are unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their fathers, so that he made them an object of horror as you see. Do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were. Submit to the Lord. Come to the sanctuary which he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. If you return to the Lord, then your brothers and your children will be shown compassion by their captors and will come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. Let's all have a blessing to this reading. Amen. You may or may not have heard that Fidi Gar, friends of Roger and Christine, and who has been here on a few occasions, passed away full home in the week. I will always remember when she was last here, I think Christine said she knew her, uh, her cancer was there, but she was blessed, wonderfully blessed as she sang one of those choruses and it was good to see that she was so blessed <coughs> even in that circumstances and that's a lesson for us as well. So remember the family of Feed God in our intercessory prayers. Heavenly Father we again come to you in prayer and we do pray for the family of Freedom God. Lord, you know the situation and the events that have occurred that seem so quick over the last few weeks. Lord, we thank you for um, relief in, in, in some ways in that you have called her home from any more pain and suffering. But Lord, we would remember and we would thank you for her life and her witness. But Lord, we would pray that you remember the family. Remember her husband, Edwin, this time. As they grieve, as they remember, as they seek comfort, Lord, remember them, we pray. You are the God of all comfort. Be real to them. Remember their friends at all, their friends as well, especially Roger and Christine. We thank you that they were able to meet, or she was able to meet with us on certain occasions. And how she was, how you seemed to bless her that that evening in the singing of some of those choruses. Thank you for being that close to her on that occasion, Heavenly Father. Lord, there are probably others, and there are others. We have our prayer list on our prayer list, our weekly prayer list. Lord, remember them. Many names, many different situations, those who are in nursing homes, those who are reaching old age and, and find the comfort in their own home, those who are distressed emotionally, spiritually and physically. Lord, we bring them to you at this time. Be real to them, we pray. If we should act, then encourage us to act. We pray. Lord, we know our nation has wandered afar from you. 
is a far from you. Lord, we thank you for your blessings to this country in times past. We pray that you will still be a compassionate and gracious God to this country, but Lord, the country needs to turn back to you. Raise up ones who will be your witness, we pray, Heavenly Father. We know that we'll have a change of leadership and government this coming week. Lord, we would pray that they would turn to your word, that they would seek your face. Lord, answer that prayer, we pray. Remember our Queen in her old age, we thank you for her witness. No doubt when she sees the new leader, she will say things. And no, I would think she would mention you, Heavenly Father. That need for integrity, that need for justice, that need to serve. Lord, remember our Queen. Remember Jeremy Nash, we pray, as he prepares to go out to the King of Faso. Lord, it's a turbulent country. There are many dangers. We pray for his protection. We thank you how you have preserved him in times past. We pray that he, that he will be able to accomplish what he seeks to accomplish on this trip. That there will be those in the country who will be willing to take all the work on that he seeks to ensure is, is happening. You know, we know of terrorism, scare tactics from enemies. Lord, frustrate them, we would pray. May your love be seen in the hearts of those in that country who would shame these terrorists and through them they would see Christ and come to know Christ as their Saviour and put their guns down. Lord, many other things we could pray for and perhaps should pray for, but Lord, as we perhaps think of them at a later time or or a more suitable time, bring to mind what we should pray for, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come let us sing of a wonderful love, tender and true, out of the heart of the Father of love, streaming to me and to you. Wonderful love dwells in the heart of the Father above.
I put the title, Have a Heart. You may or may not recall, I thought in the evenings we would look into the life of King Hezekiah and uh, see if there are any truths or lessons for us and examples for us. The heading last time was Wise Words, Wise Actions. If you remember, we found a reference for him in uh, Proverbs 25, as if he uh, reflected on some of those um, wise words of Solomon, as recorded in Proverbs. We read through the chapter, verse by verse, proverb by proverb. We noted there were a couple that Jesus referred to in his ministry, and that one that caused a bit of a snigger, verse 24, better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. We looked at the event in Jeremiah when history was looking as if it was going to repeat itself where some of the elders recalled how Hezekiah heard the warning of God through the prophet Micah and acted to resolve the wrong. Let's also remind ourselves what it says of Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18. Of Hezekiah it says, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. And the Lord was with him. That's the lesson an example for us. This evening I thought we would look at some aspects of 2 Chronicles 30. It's headed, Hezekiah celebrates the Passover. Later we will, we will recall that special Passover meal, the last supper that Jesus and his disciples celebrated, but that at which Jesus gave new meaning to two elements of the meal, the bread, the wine. But in looking at chapter 30, in doing this, I've jumped a bit from the start of Hezekiah's reign as it starts in chapter 29. And chapter 29 tells us what he did first, and we'll look at that perhaps another time. But I'll give a quick overview. His father, King Ahaz, was, was a Roman. That's one way of putting it. But it wasn't going to be father like son. Whether his mother, Abijah, was a better influence, I don't know. On the opening lines of chapter 29, you get the impression that the temple worship had ceased, or had ceased during Ahab's reign, his father's reign. The door shut and the building left. But Hezekiah had a different idea. In verse 10 of chapter 29 he says, Now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will not turn away from us. So if you go back to 29 verse 3, it says, In the first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. But my cuts, no. Worship was re-established. So we go to chapter 30. We have a statement that is somewhat hard to believe as you think of the Kingdom of Judah as a religious country. Well, at the beginning of the different kings, it says the Passover, well, the Passover festival, we find, was held in a big way. With verse 26 saying, There was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the days of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. 
Hezekiah knew there were rules and regulations. I don't know if you like following rules and regulations. Or maybe you prefer to uh, bend rules and regulations. I don't know. But Hezekiah knew there were rules and regulations withholding the feast of unleavened bread, of which Passover was part. But he also had the insight that God looks on the heart. Hezekiah wanted togetherness, unity. He wanted the people to come and celebrate the Passover with common purpose, common understanding. The idea was for a big gathering. This would not just extend to the people of Judah, but to any in what was Israel from the various regions. So the invitation, the invitation we read, was sent out to Ephraim and Manasseh and the other regions. From the towns of Dan to, let's get this right, I've, got put, I've written down here, Be- or Beersheba. I think that's from the top to the very bottom. From the north to the south, from the east to the west. We read the invitation, and if we were to read on, we find that some scorned the invitation. They said, it's not for us, but some, it says, humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. The next verse, verse 12, is an an important verse, and it's to take note of. I'll read it. Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind, to carry out what the king and his his officials had ordered, following the word of the Lord. What was Hezekiah's motivation? The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Scripture. He was burdened to hold the Passover with all the people, that they would see it, it was the right thing to do. The hand of God, the Spirit of God, was with him, in fact going before him, spreading, giving that unity of mind to all, to hold and celebrate the Passover, the festival. Let's pray that God inspires us through his word, and gives us unity of purpose. The procedures and appropriate persons, the Levites and the priests, did what they had to do according to the law of Moses, or was prescribed in the law of Moses. So you will see, what you'll see is they realised, um, well, through their actions, that they knew they had to be right with God, that the people had to be right with God, that the country had to be right with God. They realised that there were remnants of altars used to serve other gods, used under the last king um, Ahaz, were still there. They realised they shouldn't be there, needed to be taken away, removed. So they dealt with them and took them and disposed of them at the tip. It says Kidron Valley. And I think that's uh, just outside the, the city walls of Jerusalem where the rubbish dump was. And uh, that's where these ended up. <coughs> we have to approach the time of communion, confessing our sins and our shortcomings, <laughs> removing what would hinder us or divert our attention from God, from Christ. There was something else as well. Passover should take place in the first month of the religious year. It's regular time. But they couldn't or wouldn't because not enough priests had consecrated themselves. But Hezekiah and the people were minded to hold it still but in the second month. 
unity of mind was there in the people, the hand of God was upon it, and God blessed it. Let's, at this point, go back to the invitation. Perhaps you get invitations to weddings and the like, and I bet they didn't look anything like, like this. But uh, are there any lessons, truths for us? We realise Hezekiah sent it in love. He reminded Israel of their common heritage. He reminded them it was not too late. Come back. Think about it. Return. Repent. Perhaps we should look at the end of that invitation. As this gives us the reason Hezekiah thought he could send such a letter to people who had turned their back on their God, but who still their God if they would come back to him. He said, For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. Perhaps he thought of David, Psalm 86, where David quoted it. But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. But what we really find is it's what God said of himself to Moses. Exodus 34, verse 6. This is what he said of himself. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Nehemiah, which was several hundred years later again, used this in one of the verses in chapter 9 of Nehemiah, that you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Through that chapter 9, he went through the history of Israel and uh, reminded them of where they had fallen, had failed, but how God had been compassionate to them. Are you thankful that the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate to you? The invitation it was a message of hope as the gospel is today. Hezekiah, he wasn't holding any grudges. He didn't say tough, you've had your opportunity, goodbye. More, don't make a mistake, the errors your father's made. What were they? They were unfaithful to the Lord. Don't you realise, if you don't change, you will face his fierce anger. Don't be stiff-necked. And we know what it's like in the physical sense, don't we? If you uh, sit in a draft, you wake up the next morning and you, you just can't move. In it. You can't turn. You can't turn your head. If you think of that as being spiritually stiff-necked, I suppose another word we would say is stubborn. But the call was, if you return to him, he will not turn his face from you. And we're reminded of that, uh, that verse, may the Lord shine his face upon you. Return to who? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The God of the living, not the dead. He told them to submit to the Lord. We have to stop and think what that really means, even in our lives. He told them to serve the Lord, your God. We have to stop and think what that really means in our lives. To the people of Israel, he said, if you do this, there will be a reconciliation. God will do wonders. Your brothers and your children who have been taken into captivity, the captives will let them come back to this land. God will move their captives' hearts to do, to do this.
As I say, what of us? Do we do we really, really submit to the Lord in our hearts? Do we really serve the Lord in our hearts? Are we minded to witness to a lost world? Do we show them the Saviour? Do we tell them that our God can be their God? Our God is gracious and compassionate. He will forgive. He will be reconciled. He will be their God with all the blessings and benefits. The Gospel is preached today. Some scorn the messenger and thus the message. But some do humble themselves and come to the cross in repentance and faith and find a saviour, find forgiveness, find a heavenly father, a caring, loving father. If you were to look on further in the chapter, as I've been able to, there was a problem. An intercessory prayer was required. And Hezekiah was the man to realise this and pray the prayer. Under the laws, rules, regulations, set procedures, some of the people who came back from the distant parts of Israel didn't have time to purify themselves. So I haven't looked up what this involved, but they still ate the Passover. Hezekiah intervened on their behalf, which we read in verse 18. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets his heart on seeking God, the Lord, the God of his fathers, even if he is not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. Was he too bold in doing this? Too brave? Did he ask too much? Did he go too far? Or did Hezekiah have an insight on the nature and the character of God? Was he taking what we learned earlier to heart and practice? Um, and he prayed to the gracious and compassionate God who does pardon. As we know from Psalm 51, verse 17, the Psalm of David, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Was Hezekiah's prayer answered? Yes. And let's see how it was worded in verse 20. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. He made them right. So he didn't hold it against them. So he didn't punish them. If someone seeks God, sets their heart on seeking God, that reflection reveals one's own state, who comes empty handed, that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. I come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. They are healed, as it were, from the disease of sin and receive the spiritual health benefits that come with it. You'll read, if you were uh, at time in, in chapter 30, that there was much praising to the Lord. There was much singing to the Lord with the accompaniment of musical of the musical instruments. There was much rejoicing. So much so they wanted to continue on. So the celebration that had been going on for seven days was held for another seven days. A revival from the heart you might say. Verse 25 says, A great number of priests consecrated themselves 
The entire assembly of Judah rejoiced, along with the priests and Levites, and all who had assembled from Israel, including the aliens who had come from Israel and from those who lived in Judah. That unity, there was great joy. The priests and the Levites stood to bless the Lord, and God healed them, verse 27 says, for their prayers reached heaven, his holy dwelling place. We see a people right with the Lord, their God. Chapter 31 tells us what happened next, but uh, again, that's for another time. <coughs> Just a quick summary. Hezekiah was led by God's word, by doing what was good and right, wanted to be faithful before the Lord his God, praying, caring, insightful, active, aware of errors, but wanting to walk aright, and he did. And so may we do likewise. Let's close with this hymn. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus. I wonder if Hezekiah was alive today, whether this would sum up uh, his heart. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only thee, trusting thee for full salvation, great and free. peace and blessing of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and remain with us now for always. Amen. Amen.